welcome to today's edition of the Weightlifting World podcast. Today we're joined all the way from Marietta, Georgia, by the man of 50 years' experience in the sport, John Coffey. He's coached Olympians, world champions and multiple US champions and Pan American champions. He's not someone that says a great deal, but when he talks, it's wise to listen. He's probably read more into weightlifting than anyone else I've ever met, and has always welcomed us from across the pond whenever we want to come and train there. Welcome, John Coffey. How are you doing? Good morning. Good morning. It's lovely to see you again. It's been a long time since I've been to Georgia. Um, also, John is joined by Edward Baker, who's not only his technical guy, but also an amazing sub-105 lifter. How are you doing, Ed? Hey, I'm doing all right. Appreciate you saying that. Not at all, mate. Not at all. So I'd really like to, to get a quick insight, um, as it's, it's been a long time since you started in weightlifting, but... How did you get involved, John, in the early days? What brought you to the sport? I first heard about weightlifting back in the early 1950s when Paul Anderson, who is from Georgia, was the Olympic champion in 1956. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was in the newspaper and was spoken about. And uh, eventually, uh, a friend of mine and I, David Jones, uh, rode down to Vidalia and, and met him and talked to him and uh, he directed us to Howard Cohen in Savannah wow. who we, uh, we lifted far and, and lifted in his gym for many years well, so the, um, obviously you, you met Paul um, uh, some people believe that Paul is maybe one of maybe the strongest man who ever lived naturally the strongest man perhaps who ever lived what's your perspective on Paul Anderson? <laughs> Well, it, there certainly was a time when he was the strongest man. There certainly have been some men who have lifted a bit more than he lifted. Mm -hmm. uh, he, uh, if, if you want to uh, put a historical perspective in it, you might say that he was the strongest man who ever lived. You, maybe Lewis Sear was the strongest man who ever lived. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe Sampson was. Who knows? Who's to say that? <laughs> yeah. It's a question that can't be answered. Yeah. Uh, but uh, he was certainly a very strong man, and, and strong in many ways, and, and squatting and pressing and pulling and hand strength. He, he had it all. Yeah. Uh, so he is certainly a, a worthy candidate, is, is certainly one of the strongest men that ever lived. So when you, you first went there... Um... You were you immediately hooked on the sport, or, or did it take you some time to grow into it? Well, we were David Jones and I had been doing Olympic lifting for since we were kids. We did Olympic lifting on exercise sets. Huh. We didn't even have Olympic bars, but we had been doing Olympic lifts since we were 10, 12 years old. So when you started, was Olympic lifting quite popular in the U.S., even though? Um... Well, we, you know, we were in a very isolated little town of Eastman, Georgia, in South Georgia, it was it was uh, 150 miles to uh, any city at all with as many as 100,000 people, okay. and so we read about it in Strength and Health magazine and in Iron Man magazine that we could get on the the newsstand at the drugstore, and that's how we knew about Olympic weightlifting. And then we would stay up. I remember 1964 we stayed up late to to watch Isaac Berger and Yoshinobu Miyake lifting at the Olympics. 1964. Wow. We saw them both clean and jerk 336, and which was a world record. Yeah. Berger did it first, and so he got credit for the record. So uh, we were we were always into lifting, and of course we played football, and we knew that that would help us in in football. Sure, sure. So you you you've always been involved in it. Um, were you a competitive weightlifter? You know, did yes. You? Okay, so what what were your between, sort of uh, results back in those days? Between uh, 1965 and 1979, I think I lifted in about 75 weightlifting meets. Wow. Not particularly successfully, but okay. On the local scene, I was all right. What? I did a 255 press and a 220 snatch, 285 cleaning jerk. Pretty good. As my weight. Oh, at what body weight? 165. 165. Okay. Nothing to write home about, but mm, it's okay. Not bad. I, I think a, a lot of people wouldn't mind that even now. And now, and you were learning that at a time when 
you couldn't go on the internet and look at thousands of weightlifting videos and technical aids. You were doing no, it we, all from... We learned what we knew in Strength and Health magazine. Yeah. And, and, and in the various local meets that we attended. Incredible. Now, Dave Jones, my training partner, was uh, won a silver medal in the uh, 1979 Pan American Games. He was a very he was national champion twice. He was a very good very good lifter. So how long did it take you to realize that there was something more than just competing yourself and that you you knew you were going to be a fairly good coach? When did well, that change be, happen? No, we were well, there were no coaches in those days. So you were not only a weightlifter but you were a coach. We would coach each other. Okay. And so you from day 1 you were both coach and a lifter. You had to analyze what you did, what what he did, and he would do he would do the same. And of course, we would read Strength and Health, particularly would have Lifting Corner magazine, even in the Weeder magazines that there was uh, training articles. Oscar State and, and an Englishman and uh, Al Murray and Dave Webster would have articles in in Muscle and Fitness, and and so uh, there there were you know, Muscle Builder as it was called in those days. So uh, there, there, it was possible to, to read about weightlifting training methods, even in the uh, late 50s and into the 60s. In, in, the, in those early days, um, what particular gems of wisdom, what particular pieces of advice um, did you find in those magazines that have stuck, well, that stuck with you? They would have training routines and there would be articles about technique. Uh, there were articles in, in Muscle Builder magazine about technique and, and, and in strength and health. Tommy Kona would have articles yeah. and, uh, and uh, they would, it was possible to read about uh, the technical aspects of, of weightlifting training. And were there any specific pieces of advice that have stuck with you? Well, uh, some of the Tommy Kono articles were very good yeah. and very worthwhile. And uh, I would read things by Al Murray. It was an English coach, yeah. But but he'd be and he'd be in muscle builder, and and Dave Webster would have things. He, from time to time, you'd get hold of a book uh, about uh, weightlifting technique, and uh, you know you'd learn things going just to the local meets. Yeah. Um. So it, it was possible to to learn a bit about it. And of course, in that era, um, the USA was more successful. As a weightlifting nation, than it than it has been in more recent times. I guess that's that's fair to say. America America was a more successful nation in weightlifting then. Well, the standards were not as high. Yes. Uh, it is worth taking note of the fact that weightlifters in the U.S., even though there's very stringent steroid testing, uh, the steroid-free lifters nowadays in the U.S. Are lifting very respectable weights yes. for people to clean. Yeah, and, uh, and it's just it's it, it's just uh, unfortunate that they're lifting against people who seemingly manage to uh, beat the test. Yeah, and they're, they're probably uh, scientific uh, principles that they are aware of that we don't have access to. Not to say that we would use them sure. if we. we uh, so how quickly did you decide that you wanted to open a gym and of course Coffee's Gym is, is how we came to meet you and it's really a, a worldwide known place um, it's infamous yeah, we opened, I opened here in 1980 Okay. and uh, David Jones and, and his brother Gary and I had little small gyms in our hometown uh, back in the early 1970s and would would train some weightlifters there. And of course, we would travel around the South, and David would go. We would go to New York or Chicago or St. Louis, wherever the nationals were being held. Yeah. David would lift in some of those meets. And you've always so been we, in the same building. We're connected. Have you always been in the same building? No, this is my third location here. This is a smaller location. I. Used to have a little larger location, but the, okay. this is smaller. So, so when did you, when did you first realise that coaching female weightlifters would be your niche? 
Well, uh, about the time that I uh, mm -hmm. opened my gym in 1980, mm -hmm. the first women's nationals was held in Waterloo, Iowa. And uh, I had a few girls that wanted to lift in it, so I trained them for a few months, and uh, it just went on from there. It, it seemed like a th the thing to do. Women would show up that wanted to be weightlifters, and yep. I would train them. Um, it was just an idea whose time had come, it seemed like. Yep. And uh, eventually I became a little obsessed with it. And we won a national championships, and then you say, well, how many team titles might we be able to win? Yeah. Uh, so uh, it just kind of kind of took off. Because there have been some very good male lifters from here. Sure. Uh, Brian Jacobs, Mike Jakes, Tommy Inglesby. Uh, Edward Baker. Some... Ed, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Not quite up to those uh, lifters levels yet. But... <laughs> so just, just run, run us through... You run us through some of the uh, the names of the the male lifters there. Just run us through some of your most successful female lifters and some of their achievements. Well, it was uh, Marlene Colley and uh, Robin Bird, Robin Bird Gold now, Sibby Flowers. Um, well, they've been they've been some pretty good ones. Um, Kelly Rexroad Williams, who's Caleb Williams' wife. Yeah. Uh, and, and Caleb started here. A few years ago, um, so and he's one of the very good ones. He's probably the last really good male lifter that was in it was international caliber that trained here. Yeah, true. Sure. Um, so it, it would be a fairly long list of, of fairly successful women weightlifters. Lynn Stossel, uh, you know, that, that, that have trained here over yeah. the years. Emily Britton. Uh, and some fairly fairly good women lifters as well as men. Let's talk a little bit about the way your your gym is set up now. Um, I think it's fair to say that maybe seventy percent of the floor space is taken up by primarily bodybuilding machines oh, yeah. and free weights. Oh yes, um, oh, yes. You and a, a very have small to corner. Have that just to the general public. Okay, but uh, I mean, and we're a, a, a bit uh, crowded for space at times for Olympic lifting, but there's there's room for about eight. Uh, bars to be going at once, yeah. so we, we don't really get too crowded. Yeah. Obviously, I think when when I first uh, made contact with you many years ago, um, and I said that I was a weightlifter from England and I would like someone to train, um, and you very kindly allowed me to train for free, um, and you said that weightlifters don't pay here, powerlifters and bodybuilders pay. Um, so that's basically true still. Yeah. So we, we do charge some people. Yeah. But uh, not always. So just, just. I mean, I think when so when we first met, you you told me some some interesting stories um, about some of the the kind of bodybuilders and some of the pro wrestlers and and things that had come through the gym. Um, just just tell us a few of those stories. Well, I've had some fairly good bodybuilders in here. Casey Viator trained here and was, in fact, the manager here. You know, he's recently died. Yes. Um. There was some some fairly good. Tony Pearson trained here for a couple of years. Yes, you can see that was a few years back. Um, there were uh, Harry Johnson, who was Mr. America in 1959. Yep, was by some uh, some of the some of the pro wrestlers. Uh, Ken Patera, right? Ken Patera trained here oh, for wow. a while. Wow, wow. Wrestling. Uh, I had known him as when he was a weightlifter. Yes. And uh, so we've had we've had some uh, the Steiner brothers who are yes may, might be uh, somebody that you remember, but the, the Ultimate Warrior trained here for, wow. before he became the Ultimate Warrior. Yes. And um, so we've had some some wrestlers and bodybuilders here over the years. Eddie Eddie uh, Eddie Annie Rubicchio, who was a very good uh, women uh, physique uh, sure. trained here. Um, was it any, any... Mimi Jabali, who was one of the nationals, trained here. Sharla Sadaka, who was uh, one of the nationals, I think, in 1987, trained here. Yeah. So we've had three women who who got their pro cards from here. Yes. That were national champions in physique. Were there any any uh, interesting stories about the pro wrestlers? 
Uh, not any worth telling. <laughs> okay. <laughs> One thing I, I, I've always wondered about um, your your training methods uh, is is there a specific method you use, or is it a concoction of of a Bulgarian, a German, and a Russian system? Um, yeah, we, I usually don't try to be real, real formalized with it. I we, I have an outline of how I want people to train, and and then if I'm watching them train, then I usually we we go we train according to uh, the conditions of the day. Yeah. You know, what, how they've rested the night before and what they've had to eat for lunch that day and how they feel but, you know how you know so so basically it's individualized and uh, I don't necessarily try to follow any any one na- national method of, of training I, it, it's just basically we do a lot of the Olympic lifts we do a lot of snatches and cleaning and jerks and after we snatch and clean and jerk, we may do some pulls. Okay. And we, we squat, do front and back squats, preferably okay. front squats mainly yeah. these days. And we would do some uh, hyper extensions and some pressing movements and just, you know, just things to tie it together. But mainly we just do, we do the lifts and we do pulls and we do squats just like everybody else. So when you... And we, Seldom do more than about three reps on anything. Okay, so so you would say three reps on squats or three reps maximum on the Olympic lifts as well. Gen- generally, not more than two on the Olympic lifts. Okay, and then lots of singles, but we do a lot of doubles. Okay, and uh, so we may as do as many as five or six reps on the squat sometimes, but not many. Okay, I'm not a believer in doing lots and lots of reps. Okay, I think. Uh, heavier weight for lower reps is the way to go. Do you follow any specific, I don't know, philosophies or training programs with your squatting? Not really, not really. We just kind of we we'll make it up as we go, more or less. Okay. Just based on experience, though. Yes. We sure. don't just grab things out of the air. I mean, I like to think that everything I decide to do is based on the last 50 years yes you know and uh and, and and what the situation seems to call for at the time and do you make any attempt to um periodize or you know do you you know the, the... in a very very general way okay if they say if they're, if they're the 10 weeks before a meet maybe, maybe the first five weeks we'll do more reps and more generalized movements like power snatching and pulling okay and as we get closer to the meet, we'll do more of the specific squat style lifts. Yeah. And uh, and lower reps, more singles. Uh, but but so that is about as 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 uh, specific as we get with periodization. Okay. But I do I do in, in a very general way uh, follow that that uh, philosophy a, a little bit. Yeah. So I'd like to bring Ed in very quickly. The- the probably the second time I came to your gym is the first time I met Edward Baker and we sort of had a, a bit of a kinship because we both had knee problems and I know I, I still hadn't found the solution to my knee problem um, but I know that John had had helped you and and got you training in a way that was helping you with your knee um, if you can tell us a little bit about what the problem was and and maybe what what methods John helped you uh, with to fix it yeah, absolutely. Um, I started lifting in high school uh, my freshman year, and then uh, around the junior or senior year in the United States, the, you know, the Bulgarian method started getting a little bit more popular. Like, oh, you know, you just got to do heavy singles on the lifts all the time, and you know, a heavy squat for the day, and you know, that's that's really all you need to do. Sure. And um, you know, I'm I'm not the most uh, the most talented lifter as it is, so I you know I was just killed training that way. My uh, you know, I developed patellar tendonitis in both of my knees after training that way for a few months. I just kept training and training and training that way, having no appreciation for listening my body, you know, you know, hurting when I sat down in a chair standing up, yeah. my knees hurting when I woke up. And um, then uh, the very last uh, weightlifting meet I went to in high school, I met, uh, I met John Coffey and a group of his lifters, and I ended up 
going to their gym and after training for after training at coffees for a couple of weeks one of the things john noticed is my knees you know were hurting really bad he could tell you know by how gingerly i was walking you know how, you know how I was sitting down and standing up and just how it would hurt for me to even bend down to pick up the bar he could tell that i had knee problems so yeah. so probably the best advice he ever gave to me was uh was he told me you know the best thing you can do right now is just take this whole summer off and and, and don't do a thing you know don't don't do any sort of snatches, clean and jerks or squats or anything. You just need to let that recover because, you know, what's two months in the rest of your life, you know, yeah. to, to get rid of that. And so I waited the two months, came back to his gym, and my training actually had a lot more thought process going into it. I would, uh, I mainly did power clean and jerks. I may have clean and jerked once a week. I could squat snatch about twice a week. Squat snatching didn't irritate it so much. Okay. And it got to the point where I was maybe squatting w once a week or so, as opposed to squatting every single, you know, every single workout. And and uh, at first, you know, my knees were still getting irritated. But uh, you fast forward to, to um, I guess it's been close to three years now, yeah. and I really don't have any knee problems at all. I uh, my legs have never been stronger. I'm I'm just squatting once a week, front front and back squat on the same day. And, um, you know, clean and jerking heavy, maybe once every two weeks, but really just, uh, not doing the, not doing the squatting movement so much, but when I do it, you know, I, I really have an intense day and then I just have a uh, six, you know, six more days to recover out of the week before I have to squat again and let my tendons heal up. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, can you tell us a, a very quick bit about what John is like as a coach? Um, during the, the weightlifting uh, training sessions and maybe outside of that as well? He, um, one, of the, one of the best things I like about his method of coaching is, he, like he mentioned before, it, it's all very individualized, and, and he takes a, a lot of that into consideration. Um, one, of the, one of the first questions he'll ask uh, you know, when we're getting ready to work out is, how do you feel today? And, um, you know, and uh, you know, I'm start, starting a little weightlifting club myself, and I really feel like it is important, you know, to, to assess that. You, you know, you can't. I know sometimes you have to, you know, push through it a little bit. And, you know, you, if you're feeling tired all the time, you know, you gotta get a heavy workout in every once in a while. But yeah. But it definitely think it definitely helps make things run a lot more smoothly when you're you're basing it on a day-to-day -day basis, and you're not you're not such a slave to you know a, a set routine all the time. I think. I think that's why I've had so much success with him is because it's very, uh, it's very subject to change. And, and I, John, where that, did, where did that caring training mentality come from? Just, just, uh, experience, just common sense. I mean, it, it just seems to come naturally for somebody to train according to the way they feel that day and according to what's gone on in the past. And, and your observations that you've made about how they respond to various regimens of work. Sure. And, and rather than just uh, try to have some fixed idea about how things is, have to go, you, you have to see how things are going. Mm -hmm. Obviously, and, you, you have the, ex the, the, the advantage of, the ex of that 50 years of experience. Um, Say you were speaking to a younger coach, maybe it's maybe it's Ed, Ed or someone else. Um, what they they don't have the the same coaching eye that you have. They don't have the same experience that you have. Um, what would you say to them would be the framework in which to work, given that they haven't got that experience? Well, the the, the thing that I would say is that you have to uh, try to see how the athlete that you're working with responds to the training that you give them and if, if they if they respond well then you can repeat but if, if there if there's some aspect of what's doing what's happening that does not seem to agree with them if it seems like they're doing too much work and they're not recovering then you have to lower the volume or lower the intensity sometimes mm -hmm. you just it, it, it just has to be individualized and you have to learn how to evaluate what's going on yeah. with, with, at that day and at that moment 
and uh, but you you also have to keep the long term uh, goals in mind that you're trying to. But but it, but you you cannot disregard what's going on with a lifter. Yes. At, at the moment that they're lifting, that they're training, you have to be aware. And just like if, if somebody if in, on several occasions, for example, if somebody tweaks their elbow, I don't care if it's at the nationals, then they are through with the meet. Okay. You don't send them back out to dislocate their elbow on the next attempt. Yeah. You, and then, then you take them out of the meet because it is much easier to, to rest three or four weeks and let the elbow heal. Yes. Then to have to go into surgery. So I mean that's just a, an observation. Yes. If, if somebody if, if somebody's not feeling well, and you had had a, a high volume, high intensity workout planned for that day, then you just you change it yeah. right there on the spot. Yes. And 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 then maybe they'll feel better tomorrow or the next day. Yeah. What are some of the the big. Uh the big errors that you find in, in new lifters that come to you, maybe some lifters that have tried to teach themselves in their, in their garage. Um, well, sometimes people are over optimistic and over ambitious and then not honest with themselves. That's why it's important to have a coach, an experienced coach that has the best interest of the, the best long-term interest of the lifter in mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they uh, are, Oftentimes, an athlete might be so enthusiastic that they are not honest with themselves, and then somebody needs to be there to put the brakes on. Yeah, just Often to push them if they need pushing. But it, it's 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 good to have an experienced person that can tell you what you need to hear. Yes. So just just kind of looking, changing tack a little bit. Looking um, into the future, where do you see American weightlifting going in the future? How do you see things evolving and changing? And you know, how do you well, see? There will be there, well. I mean, I know a lot of people that have hopes that CrossFit is going to somehow help to revive weightlifting in this country. I, I don't think that's going to happen. It is certainly wonderful that that the snatch and clean and jerk are being taught in CrossFit. And they're paying some attention to teaching correct technique. But my experience with CrossFit is that they're mainly interested in CrossFit competition, yes. where they can make money. Yes. Uh, until there is universal successful drug testing, you can't look for the United States or Western Europe to, again, achieve the pinnacle in weightlifting that sure. they may have had at one time. Yes. Uh, because you're not playing on a level playing field. Yes. And, 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 and in addition to that, a lot of the Eastern European and even Latin American countries and Middle Eastern countries are s selecting talent. Whereas in, in this country, you're just, you're dependent on just who walks in off the street. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you, there's no, there's no testing done. You know, you can't test the whole freshman class in a high school. I guess you could, but we've not tried that. I've been very lucky to have some fairly te talented people who just kind of showed up uninvited. Yeah. And uh, sometimes they just select themselves. But uh, there's, there's, there's certainly true that many, many talented ex weightlifters exist in, in the U.S. and in the United Kingdom and in Western Europe that will never hear about Olympic weightlifting. Sure, absolutely. And will never have the opportunity, even if they wanted it, they would, they would not be the coaching. And there are many cities the size of Atlanta in the United States that have absolutely no weightlifting facilities. Yes. Uh, are, are, and so there's, there's no chance that, that children from those cities will, will ever be weightlifters. Yes. And, and that, 
uh, probably not more than 1% of potential weightlifting talent is even touched by the possibility of doing Olympic weightlifting. Yes. United States, and that, that is probably true in the United Kingdom also. Completely, completely true, absolutely true. Um, and and what do you think? What do you think can be done about that? What do you think can be done to to change that, remedy that? I don't think there's anything that can be done. Okay. The truth. My... I don't think there's anything that will be done. Now, a lot of people think that CrossFit will identify talented children and potential weightlifters. Yeah. And that may be true to a certain extent, to yes. a certain degree. But it is my experience that most people that do CrossFit are interested in mainly in CrossFit. Yes. And they're interested in sharpening their Olympic weightlifting skills. For CrossFit. So that they can do better in CrossFit competitions. Yes. With the possibility of making some money. Yes. So, uh, but it, it is certainly wonderful that they at least making people aware of snatches and clean and jerks. And I guess there's no, the thing is, there's no incentive for CrossFit to steer people away from CrossFit. No, um, not much. But the, the, the one thing I, the, the perception that I have is, is in a, couple, a couple of areas, is firstly, if, if CrossFit is directing people towards weightlifting to sharpen their skills for CrossFit, then it is directing perhaps some revenue into weightlifting. It's directing some funds, some, 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 some coaching, some money for coaching into weightlifting. So perhaps it will allow us in weightlifting to in, improve our facilities, for example. Yes. And, and, and there's certainly, if, if there was a chance that uh, there was money involved in, in Olympic weightlifting success. Yeah. yeah. That might pull some people in. Uh, a lot of people are able to make a very comfortable income if they're top track and field competitors. Yes. Or uh, winter Olympic competitors, or swimmers, or gymnasts. Yeah. They, they're able to do commercials and they're able to promote various uh, articles of clothing and and equipment what yes. have you but there's very little of that in weightlifting yes so weightlifting will always be the red-headed stepchild sure of that but one thing the US, probably in the United Kingdom one thing we've seen is that um, British weightlifting as, as a governing body has been um, very very clear in that it will support CrossFit clubs CrossFit gyms if they affiliate to British weightlifting, um, so if they're an affiliated club and they have you know coaches that are British weightlifting affiliated, and what that what that does do is it does um, it, it does increase the funds available to the governing body to then go back to the grassroots and develop younger lifters. So I think that's one positive. I think the other thing we'll see is perhaps in a generation's time, when the children of the people who are doing CrossFit now will expose their children to weightlifting at a younger age. Um, and obviously, in recent times, children just haven't been introduced to weightlifting at a young age. But it is hard to, to do the typical Western lifestyle and have time to do the training that's necessary to reach the top in weightlifting. Yes. The people that have school and jobs and the, the things that most people have to do leave probably not enough time to put the time and effort in to the training maybe twice a day sometimes yeah you don't have the just like the the the, the uh, program that the, the Bulgarians had under Abhijay when they were all in housed in a hotel and yeah. they, they didn't they didn't go outside for weeks at a time. Yes, and they had them totally cloistered and and disciplined, and they could eat when they wanted them to eat, and they rested when they wanted them to rest. And I'm not saying that's a good way to live, but it is a good way to produce good weightlifters. For sure, and then that they have that. I think in China now, yes. and I mean, maybe somebody in Russia, North Korea, and some in some of the, some of the uh, 
old Russian republics may have a version of that now. Yes. And, and maybe even in, in the Middle, Middle East, like Iran, people are professional waitresses, so to speak. Yes. And they have the time and, and they get the reinforcement, the cultural reinforcement, yes. the financial reinforcement to do it. But that kind of setup does not exist. Here's, here's a question for you. As, as someone that's obviously been heavily involved in female weightlifting in America, in, in recent times, it seems that Canada seems to have had some success at the higher, higher levels of female weightlifting with um, you know people like Gerard, um, people like um, the, the the girl that did very well at the World Championships, uh, Marie Bochaminado. Um, then there was uh, Marilou uh, Devoir Provost. Um, they uh, Kazi, uh, not Kazi, uh, Who's the other girl? But there's been three. There's three very good female Canadian lifters there, and there are others as well. Um, why do you think that? Canada, that Canada has been able to perhaps be have more success in developing elite level performers in female weightlifting than America has. Well, they may. I don't have a lot of specific information about what happens in Canada. Yeah, but they may have a little bit better connection to the way the Eastern Europeans do it. Okay. Do. And they may have, Canada does not have quite the outdoor athletic season that we have in the yes. States. It's cold and you have to do a lot of things indoors. And uh, they may have a little bit better connection with Eastern European methods than we'd have. And uh, well, that's think... enough said about that. Okay. Because <laughs> I think all three of those girls come from... Um... French Canada, um, so I wonder if perhaps having that very um, kind of that, that that area of the country, which has a completely unique culture to the rest of the country, yes, I wonder if that has some impact as well. It may well, it may well. Okay, I've got another question for you. Um, clearly, you're you're I don't know ninety five percent involved in weightlifting um, all every day of your life. Are there other things that you're involved in? Do you have any other hobbies, any other interests? Or is it just weightlifting? Oh, yes. I, I have a social life, and I like to read and go to movies and and, and be with friends and, uh, you know, that sort of thing. I'm, I'm not totally one-dimensional. <laughs> and and, and, and I'm, I'm getting to be an old man, and I, I don't spend all my time with weightlifting. I don't have... I don't think I have quite the, uh, the weightlifting activity that I used to have. Okay. There are a few people that, that come in, and but it's it's not quite at the level that it was at one time. Okay. Uh, and I think it's the, it may be beginning to to uh, peak out a little bit. So I do, mean, you, I do you see that there will need to be a, a kind of transition, <laughs> a kind of a handover from yourself to younger coaches at some point? Well, there already are. Okay. You know, there, there are uh, coaches that are coming along, and uh, I won't mention any names, but there are lots of there's lots of activity besides this place. Yes. And um, and uh, you know that 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 is all well and good. But what about and, what about uh, within your gym? Are you trying to put things in place for the future for weight, weightlifting at coffee? Well, gym? Edward Baker here is is seems to be interested in coaching. Good. And uh, so he may uh, he may do some coaching. You know, he already is. Okay. And, uh, and Robin Robin Bird Goad coaches uh, for some of her children. She's got three very talented children, and and some of their friends are coached by her. Uh, Ursula Garza out in uh, Austin, Texas, lifted on this team, and she's coaching. Uh, lots of uh, kids and, and people in Texas. So we already have, uh, and, and, and of course, there, there are a lot, I mean, you know, there are lots of offshoots and and lots of people, certainly at the centers beside me. Uh, Glenn Penley has a, a center over in South Carolina where he's coaching weightlifters. Yes. So uh, so there, there is certainly some hope for the future. Yeah. 
just obviously you've you've seen many many years of weightlifting. You've been to many many international competitions. Just um, give us a few stories, a few a few things that you know you've seen, a few things you've experienced, some stories that involve some potentially well known weightlifters that would make our listeners laugh. That just some some, some interesting stories from your international weightlifting experience. Well, uh, course, the, the world championships, you know, after the lifting is over each day, you know, you have a beer or two and you kick back and, uh, 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 I don't know how specific I should try to get, but, uh, there've been some laughs and some good times had, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, I, I've uh, met lots of people from different countries and uh, and and had you know some uh, you know some fairly interesting times with people. What was the first uh, international competition you went to? Oh, I, I was I went to see, I saw Alexi do the first five 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 oh one clean and jerk. Wow. Uh, in Columbus, Ohio in 1970. Okay. Uh, and uh, I saw him lifting several times. Uh, so, uh, Serge Redding, was, was, he, was, he was able to speak English, yeah. and I was able to have conversations with him. He was a very well-educated man and a very cultured man, and was he lifted more or less in Alexei's shadow and was, was had bad luck. It's not generally known that he cleaned 503 soon after Alexiev did his 501 in Columbus, but he missed the jerk. And uh, I wonder if he would have how, if he would have been lionized for that, yeah. and then maybe made the cover of Sports Illustrated magazine. But um, there is, uh, you know, you there are lots of. Uh, I went with Robin and uh, in 1991, they had the World Cup Gala in Barcelona, which was the uh, prelude to the Olympics. And uh, she w w was fortunate enough to break the world record in the snatch in her weight class. And that was a, a very interesting trip. Uh, they had, they had that's, they had women and men, they had the top 20 men and women from the world mm -hmm. were invited to that just to, kind of try out the uh, Olympic venue in Barcelona. Yeah. And uh, that was a very nice trip. Um, but uh, usually when I, when I would be the coach, I, I, you would be just about totally preoccupied. Sure. Even after the lifting was over, you'd still be busy trying to get ready for the next day and, and trying to watch people train and trying to make sure people made weight, that sort of thing. You know, it's a, I, I gave up trying to coach internationally a few years ago, but I just didn't think I could. That was not ever the most enjoyable part of it for me. Who were the weightlifters from around the world then that uh, back in those back in those early days that you looked up to? Um, you know, for me, my poster boy probably would have been Yevgeny Shigashev. Who would have been the, the weightlifter on the, on the wall of your bedroom? I thought I would. I, I liked Serge Redding. I thought, and, and, and I was able to talk with him, and, and uh, he was a very nice guy. Um, Kurlovich, I yeah. talked with him a little bit. Uh, I had my photo taken with with Alexander Kurlovich. Yes, he's a, he's a nice, personable guy. Yeah, he thought um, my nephew was a girl, <laughs> but then most people do, sadly. Um, yes. But he's a very nice guy. He's he's very involved now in uh, in the IWF. Um, but, um, I got to be a little bit of friends with the uh, the Greek coach. Okay. Um, that, uh, that, that was was coaching um, some of the Greek Olympians. Uh, he he at one time lived in Atlanta, Georgia before he became the coach of the Greek team and had a pizza restaurant here. Oh, well. <laughs> I knew him from there, and then he moved back to Greece. So, so I've, I've uh, known a few of the uh, 
some Germans and and, and some Turks and all of that that I liked. Who was the who was the greatest weightlifter you ever saw lift live? The one that impressed you the most to watch? I think, I think David Rieger might have been. Okay. Azanowski. And, and I was able to talk with him. He spoke English fairly well. He was a very nice man. It was so sad about his death and about his tragic end. But uh, I thought he was a very nice man. And I was able to talk with him at times. Um, uh, I, I, he may have been one of the, he certainly was one of the all time greats. And of course, I'm, I think I'm pretty good friends with Tommy Kono. And I, and certainly he is one of the all time greats. Yes. Yeah. And, and it's still it's still going. I think he must be eighty five years old. But he's still very clear minded and, and has a and and very uh, personable and, and I am in contact with him from time to time. Well you you were kind enough to give me a copy of his book when I yes. was at your place once and I've I I read that book regularly and I, I lend it to people regularly and you know I, yes. I, I uh, take take Bits of wisdom I from that regularly. One of the all-time greats, both on and off the platform. Yes, it's very interesting when you in his book the way he talks about the period yeah. in his life where where his uh, life outside of weightlifting was very busy, and he he only had short periods of time, maybe a few times a week to train, but he still got some excellent results with minimal time, just with very focused training. But he was lucky in that he lived. He lifted and lifted in a time when the standards were not quite as high yes. as they are these days. Yes. And you could probably have success with a little bit less training. Yes. It has become so specialized, and it, there's so much time involved in reaching the top. Yes. That you have to almost have a lifestyle that revolves around weightlifting. 24 hours a day. Yes. And it, it is hard to duplicate those kind of conditions in the West. Yes. Well, we, we, we were just in Poland for the World Championships and uh, we met the North Korean team and we, we spoke a little bit with the North Korean team. And you can, imagine, you can imagine the situation in North Korea, how their lives are structured. Um, it, oh, I imagine. Unbelievable. You can imagine. They do very well. It must be. And, uh, anybody who's a, a weightlifter in North Korea is probably a fairly lucky man. Yes. For North Korean. Well, you would think. I mean, it's uh, it's very interesting when you think about the difference, the difference culturally and politically between countries like America and Britain and countries like China, North Korea, whereby, you know, in Britain and in America, your success in weightlifting will deliver very little to yourself or your family in the way of. Um, you know, mater material goods and remuneration. Whereas, if you're in China or if you're in North Korea, both yourself and your family will be very well looked after by the government. So your success is directly dependent on how well your family perform, and that's an incredible motivator. Yes, yes, it is. And that, I mean, and that is a very good incentive, just right there. And here, in in in, in the West. You almost have to make a sacrifice to be a, a, a successful weightlifter. Yes. Whereas in other societies, it is an advantage to not only yourself, but perhaps for your family too, to be a weightlifter. And, and so that is one of the reasons that we will not, and unless things change drastically, yeah. the West will not be particularly successful in weightlifting. Is there anything that you think um, U USA weightlifting could do differently to have more success or engender more success? Well, I don't know if we could. Um, I don't know if we could, to tell you the truth. Okay. Well, I think in a, uh, in a closing sort of statement, um, Whenever I've travelled to Atlanta, um, I've always tried to come by your gym, meet up with you, and and whenever we go out for a dinner, it always feels like I'm walking around with uh, with royalty, because everyone in the local restaurant seem to know who you are and they all say hi. Um, but even though you're you're sort of infamous in the world of weightlifting, um, you know I just want to say a, a real honest thank you for your 
your sort of friendship towards us. Um, even when I come over on my own, you always ask how, how the family is, how Phil is, how, how our little nephew is. Um, so thank you very much for that. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to be on your, your show. And I wish you all the best. Thank we, you. we hope that next time you're in Europe, you'll, you'll stop by stop by our gym and maybe cast your eye over some of our lifters. I may, I, may be, I may come to London in the next few months or a few days. Oh, great. I'd love, great. To I'd love you to come by and have a look at some of our, 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 our weightlifters. We have a lot of female weightlifters at our club now. Okay. So it'll be nice for you to see them and give a bit of your experience to them. Very good. Lovely. But thank you so much to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll speak to you soon. Bye-bye. Take care.